Welcome to Church Bible Study. The message today is the eyes of the Lord over God's work. Uh, let's begin with the singing of a hymn. Uh, hymn number 450, To the Work. 450, To the Work. servants of God, let us follow the path that our Master has trod. With the balm of His counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hold comes to the work to the work let the hungry be fed to the fountain of life let the will we be led in the cross and its banner our glory shall be while we have it, the tiding salvation is free toiling on For all, for the kingdom of darkness and ever shall fall, and the name of Jehovah exalted shall be in the loud swelling chorus. Salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. of the Lord, and a robe and a crown shall our labor reward, when the home of the faithful our dwelling shall be, and we shout with the ransom, salvation is free. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for gathering us yet again for uh, the church Bible study. And we pray, O Lord God, that thou will shut us in unto yourself, help us to concentrate in your message to us this evening as we ponder over, O Lord, how we are privileged to do your work and, Lord, how we ought to give of our best in every work that Thou has called us to do. We pray, Lord, that this time will be a time of learning, a time of reflection and self-examination, that, Lord, we will walk away this evening with renewed zeal to do Your work. And we pray, O Lord, that every component of this church Bible study, from the preaching, the chairing, the discussion, and the dinner, O Lord, may it all be done in an edifying way and for Thy glory. We pray and commit this time this evening into Your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the scripture reading will be taken from Zechariah chapter 4. We read the whole chapter, 14 verses in all. Okay, Zechariah chapter 4. Okay. Okay, Zechariah chapter 4. I will take the odd numbered verses and you all can respond with the even numbered verses. Okay. Zechariah chapter 4, 
verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and walked and waked me as a man that is awakened out of his sleep. And seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. And so I answered and speak to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what this be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then answered and speak unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the Lord, the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts have sent me unto you. For who have despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with this seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick? and upon the left side thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which run through the pipes and tea the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what this be? And I said, No, my lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the lord of the whole earth. Okay, the message this evening is uh, the eyes of the Lord over God's work. I'll call upon the pastor to preach this God's word to us. Good afternoon, warm greetings to one and all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. We thank God for sustaining the Church Bible study all these many years when it first started during the time of Dr. Toh. This afternoon, we shall focus on the eyes of the Lord over the work that God has entrusted us to do. What better passage from God's Word than Zechariah, the book of Zechariah, where Zechariah the prophet was raised up by God for that singular purpose. God raised up Haggai first to challenge the people of Judah who have returned from the land of Babylon to rebuild. They started about 15 years ago, but they stalled. The context of what happened is recorded for us in the first six chapters of Ezra, and so I have included in Ezra chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 24 for your reading to give you a background of what happened that resulted in the cessation of work after the foundation was completed. The enemies lied, and because they lied, the king was moved, and a very strong command from the king of Persia was sent to tell them to stop work. And the people of God just accepted it, and they did not challenge it. They just went on their own lives. They basically continued to live and build up their businesses, their families, their homes, and everything about their own life on earth. But the past 15 years, they were not able to bring their offerings unto the Lord. And during the time of the Old Testament, this was something that was non-negotiable. They must approach God through the animal sacrifices, which basically were types of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The sin offering was a type of Jesus Christ being our sin offering for our purification. The burnt offering was Christ being our burnt offering for our atonement of sin. And then now that we have our sins atoned for in Christ, we now have peace with God, and that's the peace offering, followed by the thank offering. Every time we praise the Lord and we give of our thank offering, it is in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Jews were not able to do any of these things spiritual because they did not have the temple. But some of us may reason and say, well, they did not have any temple during the 70 years of captivity. Well, not exactly seven years, or 70 years. It's only from 586 BC onwards that they did not have the temple. The 70 years of exile was by the mercies of God began in 605, while the temple was still in existence because that was the beginning of the exile when Daniel and his friends were brought into Babylon. And that was the start of the 70 years. Just for simple reference say, sake, all right, let's say or during this period of time, nearly 70 years, they did not have any temple. They could not go to the temple and bring their offerings. And yet God spoke to them, which was correct. God spoke to them for a very wonderful and long time. In the case of Daniel, from the beginning to the end of the Babylonian Empire, which lasted 70 years and into the Middle Persian Empire as well. So they did not have a temple. How come God continued to speak to his people and Daniel prayed to the Lord and the Lord heard his prayer? But that was different. It was under a very different scenario where they were put into exile by force. God enforced them to remain in exile as a chastisement on his part for their idolatrous manner of life and witness. And therefore, God continued to give them his word. God continued to hear their prayer while they were in exile. Now that they have returned into the promised land with a clear injunction from God to rebuild the temple in order to restore their holy witness. And now that you are returned back into the land of promise by God, it is now incumbent upon them to complete it, the temple. And so God sent Haggai, and God used Haggai to convict them, and they were convicted. And so with a conviction, the people said, we want to rebuild. And so God sent Zechariah and his long ministry to encourage them throughout the entire four to five years of construction until completion. And uh, chapter four of Hezekiah was vision number five that God used. Now in your notes on page one, there is a typo that I would like to correct. My apologies. After Ezra chapter 4, verse 6 to 24, you see Zechariah 5, verse 5 to verse 11. It should be Zechariah 4, verse 1 to verse 14, which is vision number 5. All right, that's my mistake. I apologize. And so I have summarized for you the previous visions, and all of them were given for the same uh, motivation, same reason, to get the people to be motivated and to sustain this motivation until the completion of the work of God. They must know that the temple that they were building is no ordinary house. They all have spent the past few years building up their own homes. Remember when the thousands of people returned at the end of 70 years, God did not say that the land of promise was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a land flowing with not milk and honey, but weeds and thorns and thistles in their farms and the cities were all in ruins. They were destroyed and they remained in ruins other than those remnants that remained behind to rebuild, which would not be much. That's why Jerusalem was still in ruins, even after they completed the temple, until God sent Nehemiah in 444 BC to rebuild it. And so the people, when they arrived, they did complete the foundation, and then they spent time building their own homes. They must understand that building the temple is not like building their own home, just like our home is not the same as the church. In the case of the church, everything has to be through the free will offering of God's people. You can go to banks and borrow money to buy your own homes. But we don't do that with church work. It is God's work specifically, 
and it must be done by God's people and uh, for the glory of God specifically. If it is true for our church situation, how much more for the temple, whereby the people in those days worship God in spirit, in truth, and in location? That means their temple was far more significant in terms of the spiritual than our church building. Because when every one of us leave this whole church building, other than our brother Artu and the family who lived here, it's just a church building. It's just a building. That's it. We don't have to face the church building to pray. The presence of God is not here when we are not here. When we assemble together for worship like this, for the study of God's word, then the presence of the Lord is with us, literally. But the moment that we all walk out, it's just an empty sanctuary. But not the case with the temple, with the most holy place, with the Ark of the Covenant inside the most holy place and the holy place with all the three items, the table of showbread, the altar of incense and the lampstand. They all have a spiritual significance, even though it was void of any human being, no priests were inside, but it was still known as the holy place where the presence of God, where the dwelling place of God literally was found. And so it was very, very important for them to understand. And because of this background, the Lord uh, revealed to us what his understanding of his work on earth ought to be. And so he taught Zechariah to teach the people of God. And because of that, we have this wonderful book to teach us. So how do you see God's work in your life? You know, time again and time again, sometimes we hear God's servants mutter under their breath and sometimes out loud, I'm so tired, I'm so exhausted, I just want a rest and I don't feel like serving anymore. I don't feel like doing anymore. I'm tired and I'm exhausted and nobody seems to notice me. I don't feel appreciated. I want to rest. You know, that kind of mindset and attitude, I'm sure it must have also flowed through the heart and the mind of the people of God in the time of Zechariah. Maybe after a year or two in the midst of the construction, the people may be tired. I'm sure there may be some Jews who were not interested in the construction. Thousands of them returned. Some would be convicted, they will build. But then those who are not involved in the temple building, they will be building their business, they will be building their farms, their homes and their family lives. And then these people have their family, their farm, and they also their family life, but they put it aside and they focus on the temple. And I'm sure after a year or two, and they see the temple still not completed yet. And then now they see their neighbors and all those who are not interested advancing their own physical material well-being while their physical material well-being is maybe not advancing as it ought to be if they were to give it a 100% focus because they put the priority of the completion of the temple as first place. And so I'm sure some of them may look across to the other side. What must I also do when they are not doing? And so God sent Zechariah to help them, to help them stay on course like all of us. And so just an overview, vision number one was beware of false peace. When you have no spiritual tempo, no spiritual life, please don't enjoy the peace and the tranquility that you have that is based upon all the material things that you possessed. Vision number two, remind them of you have to destroy before you can build. That's always the case. Remove all the rotten wood before you can build a good house. Vision three, there is a bright future for Jerusalem. All right, Jerusalem cannot have any future without the temple. It is supposed to be the city of peace. Whose peace? God's peace. How can this wonderful city, now still in ruins, the wall still not built, there were no gates. Nehemiah's time will be the reconstruction. And so this temple that you're building is going to be the heart and soul of a Jerusalem that will one day be great and grand. But they, it can't until you finish the temple. To let them know how significant and important your mission is in relation to the future of God's city. And then a vision number four, spiritual cleanliness begins with the priest. This is a spiritual work. And so God had to make sure that the spiritual aspect 
must be carefully highlighted, not just considered, highlighted. And so vision number four focus on the, the priesthood, targeting Yeshua, the high priest. And then a vision number five for our consideration is the lay leader, which is basically Zerubbabel. Together, both of them, uh, will the work be completed. One party cannot finish it. Both parties must be united for this temple to be completed to the glory of God and the blessing of God's people and the rest of the world. And then if you recall, this is also the book that we are studying for Tuesday Bible study. And then vision number six, a curse has gone out. We know what the curse referred to, the word of God. To remind the people, basically an oath. You are all sinners before me because wherever God's people were located, they brought with them the word of God. They brought with them a holy witness and testimony. And now the people realize God's high standard of holiness when God's people will tell them that idolatry is a very serious sin against God, which means you are under a cloud of great wrath from God, punishment. And so the people, the rest of the world, where the word of God, where the people of God are located because of the exile, God turned that into a blessing, in other words. Because my people, wherever they are exiled, I will make sure that they will be a light to that world, even though there was no nation during the 70 years. That's how wonderful and gracious God is. And so the urgency is there. The curse has gone out. The people need the light. You have to finish the temple so that the people, they can look to Jerusalem once more and see it as a spiritual city. And then uh, vision number seven, a warning of a return to captivity. Then, of course, there will be vision number eight. God will judge the judges. A warning of a return to captivity, which is where we stop at our Tuesday night Bible study. So let's come back to chapter 4. Will you be tired? Will you join everyone else and start to murmur and complain? The Lord has suspected some of them might during the course of the construction of his temple. And so the Lord uh, sent this vision to Zechariah to tell Zerubbabel and God's people who will be the lay leaders leading the people who will be doing the actual physical construction. He had already spoken to the priests in vision number four. Now he will focus on the people who will be doing the work itself. Know the nature of the work. First and foremost, never forget the nature of the work that you are doing. It may have all the appearance of the material world, because it is, in a sense, right? For them, it's just brick and mortar stone and mortar. It is physical, but behind it, there is a spiritual significance that sometimes can be lost to them and to us as well because of the overwhelming nature of the physical three-dimensional flesh and blood world that we are doing. Sometimes we forget that it is a spiritual exercise. This Bible study is not like the gathering in any community center or any of this talk that you find in all these auditorium. This is a spiritual gathering. This is a spiritual exercise. The reason why this was started, the church Bible study, was because we pray and hope that the congregation will study God's Word together as a family. That's why we have children ministry studying the Word of God while parents come together, and then after that, they have dinner together. Hopefully, it will instill in God's people, the importance of a family life that centers on God's word, and because of that, it will be on Christ as well, because the Bible is about Christ. It's one thing to say that we have a Christian family. It's another thing to really experience the Christian life as a family, studying God's word together with God's people, that's the purpose and significance. It's a spiritual ministry. So are all the ministries, including those who give out weekly every Sunday, those who serve in the kitchen. It's a spiritual ministry because it's from God. That's number one. 
That's what the Bible says. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, where do you think the angel got this message from, this vision from? You think the angel just simply awakened and then it came into him? You think he's the source? He's just an angel. An angel is basically a messenger. He is not the source. He is the messenger sent by whom? By God. That's basically something that we must never forget. The nature of the world begins with the fact and the knowledge that it originates from God. It's from God. Don't forget that. Everything that you do in your own home as well, it is not limited to the church premises. In your office, it's the same thing. The rest of your office, workers, colleagues who are not believers, they are not doing God's work. You are. That's why one of the questions for discussion, number five, is there a difference between the work of God in the world and the work of God in the church? You've got to discuss. Now, the word work, therefore, the work of God, the inverted commas are missing. All right? The word work. Please put it in inverted commas because that is for emphasis. For you to think very carefully, that's the clue, okay, for you to look at when you answer this question. Right? That's why I put inverted commas. You are doing God's work in your school, in your place of work, employment. Don't forget that. You want to start your own business, it's also God's work. You can never, never get out of doing God's work. Why? Because you are God's child. That's basically it. That's why, because it comes from God and He is our Heavenly Father, therefore it is God's work. That's the first fact about the nature of the work that we must bear in mind continuously as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And then he said to me, what seest thou? Well, I, I said, I look, have looked and behold, I saw a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and seven lamps thereon and seven pipes of the seven lamps. So it will be the menorah that you see when you go to Israel, you have all these small and big for tourists to buy, right? The lampstand. So you have the pipes, and then on top of that, you have the bowls, the lamp itself. So basically, it's the lampstand. The significance, I'm sure you can figure it out. Because the lampstand, from the very beginning in Moses' time, has the symbol of the light to a world. Israel must remember that you are a light to a world that is dying in sin. And so it is located on the left-hand side, of the holy place as you walk into the holy place. And then on the right hand side, you have the table of showbread, 12 loaves of bread. And then right in front, you have the altar of incense in front of the veil. And behind the veil will be the most holy place where you have the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. And so this picture of a lampstand that God purposely used will have the same meaning and significance that the people would understand. And so would Zechariah. The temple you are building has a spiritual purpose. It is to be the light. You are all the people of the light. Jesus said the same thing to us in the Sermon on the Mount. The moment you are born again, you are the salt and light. That's what he said about us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, after the Beatitudes. If you are truly born again, know that you are a salt that will stop the decay that is in the world by your salty holy life, and then you are to be the light at the same time to point out by your teaching and by your sharing and your action that there is a way out of the darkness that the God of this world had enforced into the minds of all those who rejected the gospel. You have to live a life of holiness to give them an alternative. This picture of the light is very, very important. Don't ever forget and without the temple being built, you can't be the light because the light means spiritual. And you cannot be a spiritual people without the temple. And that's why you have to build it. No matter how difficult, no matter how burdensome it may appear, you have to stay the course until it is done. And then there are two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side. Okay? 
And they are mentioned again in the last verse. They are the two anointed ones. And we're going to look at their identity if you have forgotten. Or if you remember Tuesday night Bible study, we mentioned who they were. We'll talk more about that as we go along. The nature of the work, it comes from God. The nature of the work, you are a spiritual people with a spiritual responsibility. How? As light to a world that is in spiritual deadness and darkness. And you are the only ones that God has appointed from the very beginning of your existence, as far back as the time of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, a special nation, a special people, where everything about your life originated from heaven. From the food you eat, what is clean and unclean, from the garments you wear, from the way that you are supposed to farm your land, and how you yoke your animals together for the tilling of the ground, your holy days, all of them, they have a spiritual significance that God gave to them. You are not like the rest of the nation where everything in those nations are rooted in idolatry, where the leaders will do what is right in their own eyes. You are a people of God where you are supposed to do everything that is right in the eyes of God by simply following the Bible. That's how you are to be the light. That's what we must bear in mind when we serve the Lord in any capacity. Whatever the Lord lays your heart to do, don't forget that. Your family is supposed to be the light. Your ministry is supposed to be the light. Whether it is car park marshalling, it's not just simply going there and control cars. How you do it is so important. You can create so many problems by how you do something that is like car park marshal, you may think there is no big deal. You cannot just simply get anyone to do car park marshalling. Every ministry must be very carefully considered and weighed. Availability is maybe the first qualification, but it is not the only. Just because you're available doesn't mean that it is uh, the right ministry for you. You go tracting. You know how dangerous it is to go tracting? You want to go on a mission trip. Do you know that we have heard of people who went on a mission trip and they came back and they confessed and said, I'll never have any, I'll never go on any mission trip ever again. You know why? Because they were stumbled. They went on a mission trip with an idea of something that is maybe very glamorous. Maybe it's from books that they have read or from some documentary they must have watched or whatever. They went there with some kind of preconceived idea and notion of what to experience but when they actually experienced it, they were devastated. They came back and they were not the same. Negatively speaking, I will never go on any mission trip again. So it's a spiritual exercise, spiritual work. They must never, never compare the temple building with the temples of all the Gentile nations. Neither should they compare it with their own homes. The work you do for the Lord is from God and it is always spiritual in nature. And this is again emphasized by the method in which the work ought to be done. Verse 4 to verse 6. Right? Because it is spiritual, what do you think the method ought to be? And so I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these? My Lord, explain please. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? Don't you know? No, my Lord. And then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. All right, so this is the message I want you to speak to Zerubbabel. So now we have an, a clue that one of the two olive trees would be Zerubbabel. All right, it is meant for the leader of the lay people to tell them that you are to be the light. What you are doing, you are to be the light to the world and there is no other people that God has chosen other than you. Do you realize how privileged you are? And then, therefore, you must not say, by might nor by power, we are going to get it done. But by the Spirit of God, you will get it done. That's how we know it is a spiritual work, because the method in which it is to be done is spiritual. It's by the help of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. That's the key. Which means, what? Completing the temple is not the focus. What does that mean? Completing the temple 
is not the focus, but the journey toward the completion of the temple is the focus. That's what it means by not by might, not by power. So do not use your connection to very important, powerful government officials, nor by money power, nor by just simply giving your money, get all the multi-millionaire to donate. It's not these. It's not just the completion of the project. That's what the world will do. Whenever they want to have any building project that may cost millions of dollars, the most important thing is the completion. Very often, the whole process is usually not the focus. They just simply want it done. The deadline is there, get it done, because the moment it is completed, I begin to make money. But for them, it's not the completion of the temple, then you begin to be a holy witness. It's much, much more than that. Because it is by the Spirit of God, which means God said to His people, God wanted Zerubbabel, the first man, the leader, to realize. If your faith, Zerubbabel, and the faith of all the Jews who are helping you, who have been convicted and set aside their time, their energy, and their substance to do my work, if their faith is not deepened and strengthened in the process, even though you may have completed the temple, then it is missing the mark. It's always a deepening and a strengthening of our relationship with God. Because when it is by the Spirit, what does that mean? You pray. Whenever you have an obstacle in front of you, you pray. You don't just simply see this as an obstacle, a problem of flesh and blood. You pray. You think the enemies have just simply stopped disturbing them? You think the enemies have just simply died off? As long as there is work of God to be done, the devil will raise up his minions to disturb. Bear that in mind. And the disturbance will try to distract you, try to discourage you, dishearten you, whether you will slow down the work or whether you will ultimately, ultimately give up the work. The devil doesn't care as long as he succeeds to slow you down or to get you to quit. He will do so by hook or by crook. That's why we have to always pray and ask God to help us. Not by might, not by power. You can get it done by might and by power. We know that because that's how the world works, by might and by power. Money, power, and uh, mighty men can get a lot of work done. Right? You apply for permission. The government bodies will give you the permission, the green light to start building. You can get all the partners and all the people to invest by buying your stocks and shares, project to them how wonderful this project is in the future. It's going to make you tons of money. And so you raise up your stocks and shares and the people dump in millions of dollars to buy into your company. So you now have might and power. You get it done, sure. But is it God's will? Does it have any spiritual significance and benefit? Zero. You must not do it the same way that you find it in the world. That's basically what it is. This is God's temple. Don't go by the other way. The way of the world that is by might and power. And I'm sure you know this better than me. All of you who are working out there in businesses that you're involved in that are worth what millions if not billions of dollars. Might and power. That's the solution, isn't it? But God says, no, not for my temple. It must be by the spiritual approach where you pray, where your faith and your trust in me is deepened and strengthened in the process, where you see my presence, my hand in your life, helping you, holding you up, lifting you up, encouraging you. And to do that, it must be by God's word. You must do it by God's word where your method, your ethics, your morality, everything must be according to Scripture. You cannot just simply get it done because the ends justify the means. The means and the ends both must glorify God and to do that it must be according to Scripture. No other way. 
That's what we must do in all the, mis all the ministries in the church. In order for the church to be strong, to be pleasing to the Lord in every aspect, every aspect must be done with much prayer. That's why there was a time, I know we have not succeeded, whereby we encourage the overseer, the session members, for Lord's Day service, for example, to get all those who are serving as ushers to come earlier, to come together to pray before they all go their own way to do ushering. And then ask all those who are doing cup up marshalling to come, all those who are greeters to come early so that they can pray together and ask for the help from the Lord to be the best they can with the right kind of demeanour, with the right kind of patience, the right kind of mental attitude to do all this work. Not just them, all of us. But then the COVID turned everything upside down, isn't it? Everything that we pl planned and planned and planned and because of COVID, everything just got halted. And then little by little, we are permitted to open up. Little by little, little by little. Now that it is more or less, more or less, back to normal, but we are forgotten, that aspect. And so we just come as and when. And sometimes when we come, we just think that we are just simply ushering like those people who usher you during the cinema, right? With a torchlight. Oh, where's your seat? True? We just do it. Usher, no big deal. You just don't realise how important the spiritual aspect is. Right? By the Spirit of God. Prayer, and then through it, you see how God helped you? You see how God is so real to you? Because He's there, and these experiences are priceless. Priceless. And please realise and understand that once the work comes, and once the work ends, it's over. There's not going to be another temple. And those who missed the opportunity, missed the boat, they missed it for good. Do you realise how we must be very sensitive and discerning? That when God opened the door and allowed a ministry to be introduced to us, don't ever see it as a burden, see it as an honour and a privilege because the source is from God. It is a spiritual work, not by might, not by power, and one day the work will be completed. Now, whether you're going to be part of it before it's completed is now up to you. And that's our third point. Know the completion. Okay, and so the Lord said so, verse 7 to verse 10. Who art thou, O great mountain? In other words, no matter how big the obstacle might be, right? Like a mountain. Before Zerubbabel, with this leader, it will become flat. God said, Zechariah, you tell Zerubbabel, you are a leader that I have raised up. Throughout this entire project, you're going to face obstacle after obstacle like a huge mountain. They're going to pile up. But you stay the course. You trust in the Lord who called you. He will help you and you will flatten this huge mountain and turn it into a flat plain. How wonderful and imagery that the Lord has planted into the mind of Zerubbabel because the land of promise is a very hilly or mountainous country. The valley of Jezreel, according to the guide, when he brought us to the northern part of Israel, very near the Sea of Galilee region. I asked the guide, is this the flattest piece of land, the largest and the flattest piece of land in the whole of Israel? He said, yes. Because on the way up from Caesarea and Jerusalem in the coach, as you are driving up, you see a lot of undulating ground. Hills and hills and hills and hills. Plentiful. Very rarely do you see one large piece of flat ground until you arrive at the Valley of Jezreel, which is also known as the Valley of Megiddo or Mount Megiddo. That's where the Antichrist will assemble his mighty millions size army 
as a staging area before they march down south to attack Jerusalem. But the Lord will stop them there. And so for Zerubbabel, surrounded by so many high mountains, this imagery, oh, great mountain, it will remind us Zerubbabel whenever he faced an obstacle, the mountains will be there and he'll remember this vision. The Lord will flatten it in his time. I've got to trust him. Whatever the obstacle, whatever the enemies, no matter how big they are, how cunning they are, it will not matter. I just keep trusting in the Lord and the Lord will deal with them. Remove all the obstacles and through it, my faith as the leader and the faith of his people, God's people, who were assisting him in the actual construction, share with them all these, share with them the truth, and you all will grow together spiritually. And that kind of unity, that kind of common experiences is exactly what God wants all of us to have today too. And thou shalt become, that they shall become, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. That's a rubable. It's in your notes. A headstone is like the capstone in an arch. They will put scaffolding to prop up the arch as they build the stone. All right, from the bottom, you have the two side posts. They build stone by stone, and then once it comes to the arch, it begins to arch outwards. And you know, that it will collapse. So you've got to build a scaffolding to prop it up as you adjust it to make sure that it is symmetrical. And then when the two arches are about to meet, the final piece, that is the headstone. And the moment you put on the final piece, the arch will now hold in its proper place. That's the structure, right? The whole load will just simply tra travel down into the side post. And once the capstone is put up, you remove the scaffolding, now the arch will remain. Basically, what it means is, Zerubbabel, you will finish it. Just like you put on the capstone, the whole arch, the whole project is done. That's the message. And how will it be done? Grace. Grace and grace. You know how wonderful it is to be able to finish what God has entrusted you to do, whatever ministry that God put you into to do, to be involved in, it is an honour and a privilege. And once it is done, it's done. You can't go back and do it again. You know, there may be some of you who have been asked to help out, let's say, in the YF ministry, because now you are of the YF age. And so you let it pass by. And then now you are in the YAFH. You want to go back and do the YFH? Too late. It's gone. You have missed the boat, as it were. You were given the privilege by the Lord when you were invited to serve and you say, no, thank you. And now that you are in the YAFH, are you going to make the same mistake if you are offered the position again? Are you going to say yes? And then you know that it is not by might, not by power, not by how clever you are, how smart you are, how able you are. It's by prayer, by trusting in the Lord. And if you again miss the boat, say, no, thank you, because you want to do your own thing. You want to build up your business. You're going to build up your name in the world. And you will probably succeed. But as far as building your testimony for Christ, it is primarily made up, made up of wood, hay and stubble. How much of it is made of gold, silver, precious stone? Probably very, very little. You may be building a building made up of gold, silver, stone that may be a little bit better than Lot. You know Lot, right? Where his entire testimony was burned up, literally burned up fire and brimstone from heaven. How much of his testimony was made of gold, silver, precious stone? based upon what God has recorded, because after he gave birth to two of his sons, out of two incestuous relationships with his two daughters who got him drunk, we have never heard anything about him. But based upon that record, you realise that his building, made up of gold, silver, precious stone, would be a morsel, maybe 10% or less, and that's it. 90% wood, hay and stubble, all gone. All gone. Don't make the same mistake. Was he born again? Yes. That's what the Bible tells us. Just Lot. That's how he was described. Recorded as a warning, not as a good example to follow, but as a warning 
that just because you are born again, it does not automatically mean that you can do whatever you want and your life will be a holy life, a holy testimony for the Lord. You're going to take extra, extra care and consideration and prioritize in order for it to be made of gold, silver, precious stone, which is what God wants for all his children. Most of it, you will never be perfect, but let the wood hay stubble proportion be as small as possible in percentage. Would you do that? Because the work will be done. Either you pass the age, or the work is done. There was a time when offering was required for the construction of this building when it was nothing, just a piece of land. Dr. Toh's generation, we were not around. We were not given the privilege. And then there was the renovation. You know that this upper portion is extra balcony. That's why as you enter, the ceiling is a little low. It's extra. Again, many of us were not around, you missed the boat. And there was another renovation where we added the lift and then the new sanctuary. How many gave? Those who did not give, gone. Opportunity came, opportunity gone, lost. Ministry, they are like that. It will be completed. But the question is, will, were you there to have a spiritual experience by your contribution where you drew closer to the Lord, where your faith and your trust in the Lord is strengthened and deepened in the process? That's what all committee members in every fellowship must bear in mind. It's not just sitting in a committee whereby you sit in committees like in community centres or your companies. This is a spiritual exercise where you are planning spiritual menu for the people that God will bring into your care. What do you want them to us to feed them this year, O oh Lord? Please show us. And so you prayerfully seek the Lord's will. What are the messages? What are the activities? Who should be the speakers? Don't just simply invite speakers because they are available. Invite speakers that can really, really do the work and feed God's people properly. Very, very important. And then when you see the people grow, when you see them have their lives all properly led and guided by God's Word, you know how happy it is to be used by the Lord in such a wonderful spiritual fashion. And it's all done through much prayer and seeking the Lord's direction and the Lord's will. And the Lord will show you. Why will He not? This is exactly what He wants for, from, for all of us and from all of us. The work will be done. Look at what the Lord said. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, right, from the very beginning, 15 years ago. His, his hands shall also finish it. You see that? And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. That's Zechariah, you can tell them. Okay? For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Those seven would be the seven lampstand, the people of God. And they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Of course, not through the whole wide earth, but through the earth where God's people were located. How? Your testimony. How will God's eyes run through and through? Through your testimony. Do you know that when you go to office as a holy witness, basically the eyes of the Lord will be there. The people will see your holiness. They will see the Lord. When you go to school and you are a holy testimony as a student, they will see the Lord by the way you live, by the way you conduct yourself, by the way you behave. That's how important you are in the spiritual realm. Your holy life is so significant and important to the Lord. He commanded the people of Israel and us with the same command, Be ye holy as I am holy. That's how the eyes of the Lord are seen, to be known by the world. They are in every place because my people, they are my eyes. Have you not been told again and again to see the world with the eyes of Christ because you have been given the mind of Christ? Yeah, your eyes, not the eyes of the Lord, because you are to be like the Lord more and more, isn't it? You're supposed to look at the behavior and the way of the people, how they live, 
and then you are looking at it from the eyes of the Lord. Are you not? And so you are able to discern and evaluate. For example, they use vulgarity. The eyes of the Lord you tell them, why do you all want to use this kind of language? I'm sure you are married, you have children, you won't use this kind of language in front of your children. Why do you want to do this in the office? Why didn't you tell them that? That was my, my personal experience when I joined the company. These are all grown men and women that we went out for lunch together and during this conversation uh, outside of the office during lunchtime, and when they talk, they use this vulgarity until one day I could not take it anymore. After a few weeks with them, I said, can I just simply make a comment? You're all parents, right? At the time I was only in my early 20s or late 20s, 26, 27. You all are grown men, you're married with young children. I'm sure you don't speak like this. You don't use all these words in front of your children at home, right? Then why do you want to use them in the office or toward one another in the lunchtime? I just mentioned it to them. And thank God they changed. After that, all this vulgarity stopped. I could not take it. I mean, I had a, a lot of it two and a half years in the army. But I was not a believer. Too much of it. impact the world. The work will be done. Do you know that? And God says, I want you to be the light to a world that is dying. I want the world to know that I am watching the eyes of the Lord over God's work. I want them to know. I want the world to know because they all have their minds blinded by the God of this world. And I sent you and I saved you. I sent you to do my work to give the people of the world a spiritual alternative that they would not be exposed to if not for all of you. You know our Heavenly Father is leaving us behind in a very dangerous, dangerous world. There must be a very high purpose and a very, very good eternal reason for Him to do that because I'm sure our loving Heavenly Father will want us to be safe. Right? In heaven is the safest place. But he says, not yet. You will be in heaven one day, but not yet. That is a very important mission. The world is dying in sin. Just as you were once upon a time until I saved you, your heavenly Father says. Will you now be my eyes, be my lips, be my hands, and let the world know that the eyes of the Lord are watching over all of you. Behave. The Ten Commandments have been given you're all under a curse, an oath, that if you die in your sin, you will be cast into hell. They need to know this. And with this message, tell them that I love them and I sent Jesus Christ to die for them, that they do not need to die in sin and be cast into hell. They can get out of it right here and now. The moment they die, it's over. But while they're still alive and you are with them, tell them, tell them. The work of the temple will be completed and the light will shine. But will you be part of it where your faith and your trust in the Lord is strengthened and deepened in the process? You and I know that this church is not going to last forever. We pray that the Lord will be merciful to keep this church faithful and true to Christ until Christ return. And therefore, in the meantime, when the opportunity comes, please keep serving. Don't murmur and complain and say you are tired and you're exhausted. The day of rest will come one day in eternity. As long as the Lord gives us breath, please keep serving to the praise and glory of God because the work comes from God. And it is a spiritual work because we are a spiritual people. And the Lord tells us, it is not by might, not by power, isn't it? It's by the Spirit of God who dwells in us that we get the work done. With his help, pray. Pray for strength. Pray for ability and for zeal and fervency to persevere to the end. And then the work will be completed. But will you be drawn closer to the Lord in the process? That should be our experience. And then finally, know the leadership in the work, how important they are. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two 
golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. Who are they? Who are they? And he answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones, Yeshua and Zerubbabel. Why? Because the word anointed ones literally means the two oily ones, O-I-L-Y. Because the word anointed is not Mashiach. Mashiach is the anointed that is where we get the English word Messiah. This is anointed, it's a reference to the anointing oil. In other words, the lamb needs the oil to keep burning. These two leaders that I have raised up, Yeshua takes care of the priest side, Zerubbabel takes care of the lay people side, and the two leaders, they will be the one who will keep on topping up the oil. When the light is about to dim, when the light is about to go out, they must be the ones who will put on, put in more oil. In other words, they will be the motivator. They must be very, very close to the Lord in order for them to challenge and to motivate any hands that are tired, any feet that are weighed down and refuse to work anymore. The two leaders were crucial. That means both of you must make sure that you are close to the Lord so that you will challenge the people to maintain the spiritual direction and the conviction to get the work done. That's basically what it means. The two anointed ones that stand by who? By the Lord who is the what? The Lord of the whole earth. By the Lord of the whole earth. The Lord himself, Jesus Christ. They are all doing God's work. And God raised up leaders for a time such as this. In the days of Zerubbabel, Yeshua, you are all brought together by the Lord together with Haggai and Zechariah to help the people of God by your spiritual leadership and by your close walk with the Lord. Basically, the faith of the people, they piggyback on your faith. The strength of the faith of the leadership, the strength of the holiness of the leadership is crucial. Crucial. Has that changed today? No. That's why it is so important for the leaders to be spiritual and holy. It is important for them to keep studying the Word of God. It's important for every fathers and mothers to be spiritual in order for the family, the children, as they grow up in a spiritual home, you cannot relax in the spirituality. You have to keep on maturing and growing because as your children grow and mature, your spiritual well-being in the home must continue to mature to their level of maturity. They are no longer little kids, whereby they do not know much. They do not evaluate. They do not make their own minds. They will start to question and challenge. And if you are not mature enough to help them resolve all their questions and all their challenges, they might find that you are not the correct spiritual leader that they once thought you were when they were little boys, little girls. But they do not question much. They just simply accept because of their age. Same for the church, the leadership. The church, they need help because you're all bombarded from every direction through the internet and through your friends, all versions of Christianity today. And the leaders must know the answer and the solution to all the questions that you might have. And all of them must be based upon God's word. And we can't do that if we are not spiritual. That's why the Lord described them as two olive trees. Olive, olive oil. The oil, the anointed ones, the oily ones, to help them whenever they begin to grow dim and want to stop and give up. You keep the oil pouring to keep the flame burning until the work is done because the eyes of the Lord are always over His work and His people doing the work. And that has not changed today, brothers and sisters in Christ. Wherever you are serving, know that it is the work of God that you are doing and His eyes will always be over you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, may Thy Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, especially in these last days. May all of us who serve Thee not be weary in well-doing, but to persevere on to the very end as You have given to us the honour and the privilege to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For we know that the work that we do is the work of God 
for it came from heaven unto us. And you have given to us the indwelling of the Spirit of God so that we do not need to lean upon might and power, but upon thy Holy Spirit to strengthen us and to keep us focused in doing thy spiritual work. For we know that one day the work will be completed. May our faith and our trust in thee be strengthened and deepened in the process as we see the day of the Lord fast approaching and the work will soon come to an end. And we pray, Father, for the leaders that they will remain a godly and holy for Jesus' sake and for the spiritual well-being of the flock. And for fathers and mothers, may they also be spiritual and they will grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so that their children, as they grow older and older with age, they will also grow in spiritual well-being. And together, the family may truly be a Christ-centered, godly family and all the families combined together make up the church. And therefore, the church will also be holy and godly and spiritually mature for Jesus' sake. Help us, O Lord, in our discussion. And may we learn much through our discussion from one another and from thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. We're going to break into groups for discussion. Um, there'll be uh, different groups. Uh, uh, this is uh, according to different age ranges, so please go to the correct location. Um, if you're not too sure where to go, I'll be here for a short while, so you can come forward and I can direct you to the right place. The time now is 6.10. Please come back at 7 for the roundup. If you... Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let the... If you like pastor to answer any specific question, you can let the facilitator know and, and we will pass the questions on that he will address during the roundup. There will be dinner at 7.30 if you're here for the first time. Uh, you're most welcome to join us. So, um, yes. Okay, everyone, you can go for your uh, discussion. See you later at 7.
It's quite cold, huh? All right, is everyone back? There are no additional questions. All right, I shall answer the questions that are posed to you. Number one, do you struggle to see the work you are doing in your office or home is God's work? Why is there a struggle? If you are reminded that what you are doing is God's work, will it make a difference in your attitude and the finished product? Now, as you know, this question is very personal. So in my case, do I struggle to see the work that I'm doing in the church office as God's work? I'm in church. And yet sometimes I forget. And at home, with the Bible in front of me, I also forget. The reason is it is physical. The physicality of the work itself, sometimes you forget. And then, of course, the repetitive nature of it, because there is a routine. And sometimes the issues involved may also sidetrack me. And then, very often, you think that it is a matter of flesh and blood rather than a, a spiritual matter, and you get worked up emotionally, mentally, and therefore it will affect you physically. And of course, when uh, my own spiritual life is not on track, it makes it even easier for me to forget that this is God's work. Why is there a struggle? I've already explained. If you are reminded that what I'm doing is God's work, will it help me Will it make a difference in my attitude and the finished product? Yes, it definitely will. Now, we know that in the work of the Lord, we have to consult people, we have to communicate with people, we have to talk to people. We have to seek help from people, and sometimes we forget to pray. And we are too quick and too ready to just simply ask for help. Forgetting that this is a spiritual battle rather than one of flesh and blood. Now, I really share with you about this problem that I have in my home, this unwanted, unsolicited visitor. So the latest information that I have placed outside my door on my bench where I sit down to change my shoes, to wear my shoes, I put down there, this is harassment and uh, we are reporting you to the police. And so far, for the past couple of days, and today is the third day, no more delivery of unwanted goods. But I pray and hope that it will continue. But in the midst of it, and sometimes out of frustration and anger, it gets the better of me. Okay, And it affects and impacts my concentration in my preparation of my messages and my work. It affects. And then I take a step back and I pray and I ask the Lord for help and I realize that this is definitely a spiritual battle than one of flesh and blood. But I still have to do what is necessary. All right, to go to the police, I need evidence. And so I have to write to the town council for permission to install a CCTV outside. So the permission had just been granted so I have to do all these physical things. And because of the physicality of the nature of the solution to the problem, I forget that it is more spiritual than physical. I pray and hope that this will stop completely once and for all. But it is a day-by-day -day kind of an experience. 
There was a time when the, the person came and stayed outside on the 16th floor in the lobby for the whole afternoon. Just stood there. Okay, it's creepy. But there is nothing I can do. The person called me, I ignore, because the police says, don't talk to that person at all, don't take anything, don't accept anything. And that's our modus operandi. And therefore, because of all this physical nature of the confrontation and all the experiences, sometimes I forget that it is spiritual. And once I know that it is spiritual, I will not let it affect me, especially my concentration in my preparation of my work and my messages and my teaching material. Okay? So, could keep on praying, keep on trusting. There is a reason the Lord wants me to pray more, right, because of this problem. It's been going on for years, before COVID and during COVID, and now after. Number two, is what you do at home or school or office done by your own strength or the strength of the Lord? This is, again, very personal, it's subjective. It's up to each and every one of us to answer this question. But because we are children of God, we have this choice. If you are not born again, this strength of the Lord is not an option. It's only after you're born again in Christ, then you have an option. You can still do the work of God by your own strength, and sometimes it is very easy when you are experienced. Do you remember the first time when you taught as a Sunday school teacher, how you prayed without ceasing, as it were? You're so nervous and so frightened, do not know what to expect when you stand in front of the class for the first time. Now that you have been doing so for so many, many occasions, I don't think you can even count the number of times after so many years. How do you feel? Do you have the same kind of fervency and prayer and on your knees experience, pleading for the Lord to help you teach and prepare? I think not, because experience have more or less given you a little bit of confidence that is more self rather than God or Christ. And because of that, this is the problem. Our own strength become more our alternative in getting work done rather than the strength of the Lord. And when that happens, the difference is the method is one of my own hands, my own mind, rather than on my knees pleading and praying for God's help and God's wisdom, which we must do. Please understand that the material that we provide for you in your teaching, for example, all the notes and so on, please use them very, very carefully, okay? Carefully in the sense that they must not replace your leaning upon the Lord for wisdom to understand the Bible. Because when the passage is given, when the passage is explained, the danger is you stop praying, you just read, you just use your mind to summarize and to draw out which part of it you want to emphasize. Whereas without the notes, you just have the Bible verse, the Bible text, and then you just study the text, and then you meditate and meditate and meditate and plead with the Lord to give you the understanding. And then from there, you craft out your lesson. And then now the burden has been placed in your heart through all your meditation. And then when you teach it, you teach it with more passion rather than just simply take what has been provided for you and then you just simply use your mind and evaluate it because you are smart enough. And then from there, you just use your mind and get your lesson out whereby the teaching is more academic than from the heart. So please be very careful when you use the material. It is never meant to replace your trust and your leaning upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit for illumination. Okay, that's the methodology. And then, of course, the outcome, whether you get the praise or whether God get the glory. And then when you do not get the approval or the praises of man, you can become very disheartened and discouraged because you long for it. You did it by your own strength. And therefore, if you think that you have done your best and if you begin to compare with other teachers, or in my case, other preachers, 
then the danger is competition and envy and jealousy may arise. And then you want people to praise you and when the praises do not come, you get discouraged. But if you lean upon the Lord and then when you are used by the Lord for the blessing of others, you are so ready to give all the glory to God sincerely because you really depended upon Him. A world of difference. Okay, big, big difference. And when you have the strength of the Lord, your ministry will be sustained and you will have longevity. When you lean on your own strength and you don't get what you want based upon earthly accolades, the longevity will not be there because there will come a point in time where you say, enough, I give up. I'm sure you must have known of someone who has a doctoral degree in theology put in charge of the faculty of theology in a Bible college and then for whatever reason he just simply washed his hands off everything including his church, including the family, including his responsibility in the Bible college and then he penned some words that are like this. When God's people needed help, I was there to help them. When I needed help, nobody came to my help, I quit. That was it. When you serve the Lord using your own strength, use your own mental IQ, your capacity of, as a human being, you're going to be in trouble because this is a spiritual battle and not one of flesh and blood. Number three, do you agree that every work or ministry on earth will have an aim? That's for sure, because the world will end. Everything will have an end. Do you want the work or ministry you're doing now to end or to continue? It all depends, isn't it? Because we have seen enough, I'm sure, in your own life as well, when a ministry such as a church or a Bible college or a seminary gets overrun, overturned by dangerous people. In the case of a seminary or a Bible college, let's say you have liberals and modernists taking control. Let's say the president seemed to be good, but then his true colors came out, but he has really positioned himself and he could not be removed. And then he started to fire all the conservative teachers, and then he brought in all the liberals and modernists, and then banking on the reputation of this seminary or Bible college that once upon a time had a very conservative reputation. And based upon this reputation, many students continue to come. Genuine, sincere, good, born-again students thinking that they can be prepared for the ministry because they have been called. And then now they are going to be poisoned. Under these circumstances, it's better for the seminaries and these Bible colleges, including churches, to just simply shut down. Let them in so that they will no longer do any more damage. And if that ever happened to FEBC, I would rather FEBC close her doors than to continue. Because when you continue after you have turned bad, just imagine the damage. I'm sure you can imagine that based upon the reputation. And some churches and some members they may not have the discernment. They just continue to think that because the college has a good reputation, everyone who graduated from the college must be good, sound, and conservative. Not true. Not even today. Everyone who graduates from FEBC must be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, individual-by-individual -individual basis. Please bear that in mind. The best way to infiltrate and destroy a church is through the college or seminary that that church looks up to, depends upon. I'm not sure whether you are aware of this true-to-life incident where we had a family from a church that is known as a cult. And the modus operandi of that cult is to pay for the entire training of their so-called full-time workers, let them enter into Bible colleges such as FEBC, get them to train, get them to study, and then get them to graduate with their degree. So on paper, they are with us. But in mind and in heart, they are still part of their cult. And the agenda is get them accepted inside churches like ours. And then when they come in, they will say what you want to hear, sing the tune you want them to sing, 
And then after they establish themselves, they become more and more influential. They will get all the people around them that are of the same mind. And then little by little, they control and take over the church. And then they report to the sending mother church, mission accomplished, you can come. Thank God that family did not graduate. For your information, that family came into FEBC and they stayed in our church premises. Okay, thank God we have other students from the same country who told us what they were, and so we were pretty on guard. But they did not finish. They quit and they left. They're still in Singapore, I was told. Doing something else, I do not know what. So we have to be very, very guarded and very mindful. Once the ministry has turned rotten, it's better to end than to continue. Of course, if the ministry continues to be good, Christ-centered, Christ-honoring, please let it continue. Number four, how important is the leadership in your home, church ministry, Bible study or fellowship? It is the bedrock. It is so important that when the leaders are bad, everything else will fall apart. You know how the devil will destroy churches? If the early founding fathers of a particular, say, denomination is still very much alive, they came out of the battlefield. They belonged to a previous denomination that had been infiltrated, and then they fought and fought, and then they lost, and so they came out and they founded their own denomination, like our BP. So the first generation, they are already battle-hardened. There is no way the devil is going to change their stance in terms of the earnest contending for the faith. But they are old. Give them time. They're not going to live forever. And so the devil will target the younger generation. Because once the first generation of fundamental, strong, Bible-based founders are gone, the new ones come. The new ones are the ones that the devil will target, and the moment they do not have that kind of conviction, that kind of fundamentalist mindset and behavior, because they did not come up from the fire of the battlefield, they just enjoy the fruits. And so if they are not sound and good, and they are made pastors, they are made leaders, all the strong stunts that you had, that generation that grew up with the founding fathers are also gone. Now the sons and the daughters are the new generation. And if they are not rooted and grounded in the fundamentals of the faith, you and I know that it will not last. And our BP movement in Singapore is one good example, very much similar to the BP movement in America. It was only good for one generation and not even one generation because by the time Dr. Carl McIntyre was called home to glory, the BP movement in America was already floundering. Today, the largest BP church, less than 200. Most of them are just simply house churches. And if you go to America, nobody knows what is Bible Presbyterianism. There was a time in the 1950s and 60s, according to our professor in Gray Seminary that we spoke to, we asked the question, what was the reputation of the BP movement in the 1950s and 60s? They say that it was the largest, the best denomination in the whole of America, not even if it is the whole world. That was at the prime. Radios of the radios were playing and people were listening to the preaching of Dr. Carl McIntyre, who was a fiery preacher. Grace, not Grace, Faith Theological Seminary was one of the best, if not the best. That's what our professor said. And they were dispensationalists. And that's the time when Reverend Timothy Toh went over there to study. But it's gone because of poor administration, because of poor people who surrounded Dr. Carl McIntyre. And our BP movement, you look at what it was. Reverend Toh was still alive when the synod was dissolved when the lawsuit against FEBC was in, its, in the process. The Lord called him home in the midst of the lawsuit. One generation. That's how the devil works. That's how important leaders are. Same for parents. You get godly parents, you're going to have a godly home. You get godly committee members, 
your fellowship will be godly. You get godly session members, the church will be godly. That's the key. They set the tone. They set the direction. They set the theme. Is there a difference between the work of God in the world? The work of God in the world is basically based upon general grace. That's why I put it in inverted commas, because the word work, they are different. One is based upon general grace. The other one is based upon special grace, where God's children are doing the work. The work of God in the church are done by God's children. The work of God in the world means that God is still in control. Like, for example, the work of God in the world includes the work of the Antichrist, because God is sovereign. The Antichrist cannot be born, cannot do a single thing without God's permission. So that is called the general grace of God, where God will let the rain come on everyone. The sun will shine on everyone. So the work of God, from the perspective of the world, maybe you can see it under the punitive will of God. That's another perspective. The other one, the work of God in the church is based upon the desiderative will of God, where God is very pleased by what we are doing. That's another way to look at it. Okay? Any follow-up questions? No? All right, let's close in prayer and give thanks for the wonderful dinner that awaits us. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Thee for the privilege of service of doing God's work in our own homes, especially for every parent and for every children whose parents are not yet believers. Thank thee, Father, for the schools that you have placed your children in. Help them not only to study hard, but always to bear a holy witness for the Lord Jesus Christ through their diligence. And help them, O Lord, to be obedient at home, to learn to honour mum and dad always. Thank Thee, Father, also for all those who serve Thee in the workplaces. May they have the fear of God in their heart. Help them to know that You have sent them out as sheep among wolves. May they be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, always praying, leaning upon the Lord to sustain them and watch over them and help them to be a holy and a courageous and a discerning witness for the Lord in these last days. We thank Thee, Father, for this church and for all of us who serve Thee in one way or another. May we always give our very best unto Thee. May we from henceforth never to forget that the work that we do originates from Thee. And as spiritual people, it is always spiritual in nature, no matter how mundane and how physical the work might appear on the surface. May we pray without ceasing, always trusting in Thee to sustain us, to tr help us, so that whatever we do, it will truly bring blessing to God's people and glory and honour to Thy holy name. Thank Thee, Father, for the lunch, our dinner that You provided for us. Bless it to our bodies and bless our fellowship around the table and grant us all travelling mercies, enabling us to all have a good night rest and uh, prepare to worship Thee tomorrow morning. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. God bless.